Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the official Legacy Podcast. In just a little bit, we'll be talking with the Gwent Open 3 qualifier and Legacy player, Dan Arai. First, I want to mention what this podcast is going to be about. Each week, I just want to give updates on what we are doing here at Legacy, as well as doing probably an interview once a week as well, uh, just so you guys can get to know the players a little more, so they're not just MMR and ladder ranks to everybody. First, I want to give a shout-out to Lario. He is a Gwent uh, legacy player as well as writer. Uh, he came out with a recent article on August 5th um, called Gwent Player Scores and Efficiency Index. Normally if you go to the Gwent Masters webpage it only looks at peak MMR and number of games. However, Lario looks at ladder efficiency index which looks at efficiency of players so players that can play relatively few games uh, and still get pretty high MMR. You can find this article at teamlegacy.org backslash articles. It'll be the newest article there unless Lario writes something new. If you enjoyed the article, be sure to let Lario know on Twitter at Lario2 underscore PL. Again, you can just say nice article or ask him questions at Lario2 underscore PL. Also, the seventh season of the Gwent Masters 2 recently ended, the season of Griffin. We wanted to talk about the legacy players that made it. We had a total of five players in the top 64. Two players in the top 16 were Andy at rank 9 with 10,503 MMR and Javis at rank 11 with 10,495 MMR. They will be playing in their top 16 open qualifier tournament uh, this weekend August 5th, on August 15th. So good luck to them. Also in the top 64, we had Lario at rank 37 with 10,329 MMR and Danarai at rank 60 with 10,296 MMR, and Aluha at rank 63 with 10,291 MMR, and the MMR cutoff for the season of Griffin was 10,289. The top 64 tournament will take place on August 22nd and 23rd, so be sure to cheer them on. Now, I will lead in to the pre-recorded interview with Dan or I. Uh, he will be playing in the Gwent Open 3. That match will be on August 29th and 30th. Um, you can catch it and cheer him on at twitch.tv slash cdprojectred. Again, that is twitch.tv cdprojectred. Uh, that is about all the announcements that we have. Normally, I will have more to talk about in terms of different things we are working on. However, that is it. So we're going to hop right in to that interview. I have with me here Dan or I, who have qualified for the Open 3 in June. Um, congrats on making the Open number three. You must be very excited. Thank you. Yes, I am super excited because, um, well, I always dreamt of, of playing on, on Open in the first place, and I didn't really expect to for it to happen that soon. Like, I thought one day I will play on Open, but um, the qualifiers I won, that was really, really surprising. Like, I didn't really expect that. And how many qualifiers have you played in total to actually get a chance to go to an Open? Okay, so I had uh, three top 64s before. Uh, every single one uh, was pretty much the same story. Like, I've, I've lost the Swiss very, very early with, I don't know, it was like 1-3 all three times, I think. And I also played one top 16, which was actually my best run, but I was still pretty underwhelming. Um, and I finished eighth, I think, that qualifier. So it, it wasn't like I was ever close to actually qualifying before. Okay, yeah. You said you were excited, and you actually posted a clip to Twitter, I think, the day of or maybe the day after. And here is part of that clip. Okay. Casually... You sound very excited. So what did that moment mean to you? It definitely meant a whole lot because I was uh, I was recording the the whole whole run, mm -hmm. uh, day two, I mean, and I well, I was like saying to myself that I shouldn't really scream, like I shouldn't get too excited because I was aware that I that I am actually on open a couple minutes before that. So okay. 
yeah and I was like I'm not gonna scream I know I won and then I did anyways because it was just like I felt the relief after playing for a whole two days um mm -hmm. yeah how about to how many total hours were you playing between the two days um that actually wasn't that much like because because I've won the day two without falling to the losers bracket so it was actually something like hmm, ten games of ten games of Gwent. Okay. Six six B six B O threes for B O fives. Okay. Yeah. I guess that was that was something like ten hours. So that's not that much compared to what some people had played and didn't qualify. Um like, you know, it was only four games day two, it wasn't seven like some people did have before and didn't qualify. Yeah. So at least I'm I'm happy that that I didn't have to play too much because I usually get um, after my first loss uh, for a day I get kind of I start playing worse. Yeah. Or again after uh, whenever I play Swiss like the last round of Swiss actually I play pretty badly already. So if it happened to uh, if I happen to play more than those four games I might have not make it actually. So you think just the path, like winning the games that you needed to win, helped you, helped you yeah, in, in the victory massively. there. Massively. Yeah, because yeah. if I remember correctly, um, normally if you go into the losers bracket and you lose the like the, the winners finals and you drop down, you have to wait two hours until those games actually catch up to you. You mean the the, the winners bracket, right? Uh, when you lose in the winners bracket, you fall yep. into the yeah, mm, two hours sometimes more, but it's still pretty comfortable for the person uh, that has just fallen uh, yeah. to the loser's bracket compared to like the person that had to win, I don't know, four in a row to get there in the first place. And that's like, I guess you have momentum, but at the same time, you're super tired while the person that lost uh, a final before could have taken a break, done something in between those games. So, yeah, I mean, the stats, the stats show that pretty much always the person who uh lost the winner's final then won the loser's final okay yeah so you mentioned that uh, you recognize that you won um or at least we're probably going to the open a couple minutes before you actually did did you did this open feel any different than the first two that you went to like did you feel like you were actually going to make it to day two and then do so well on day two as well um no not really uh and that's that's maybe a part why i actually did uh, do so well because the more i put pressure on me the worse i was performing mm -hmm. and this time after already like four pretty pretty bad losses not not bad but disappointing i i wasn't really expecting anything and that might have actually helped so do you think that was the biggest reason you found success in this qualifier or was there, or was there anything else like preparation wise, or just anything you did before the games, like the week before going up to them? Do mm -hmm. uh, you think that helped out? Uh, so there are two additional things, mm -hmm. and first of them is because uh, this, uh, about the preparation, I actually didn't prep uh, at all. I mean, I did, but the day the day before that, I switched my decks to something I didn't really try because I felt like I just had to do it because. I basically decided to gamble and target SK mm -hmm. and before that I didn't really plan on doing so and I actually missed the target because not many people took SK and I also didn't really play well versus SK when I actually got it uh, to play against but I still almost almost didn't but I did manage to make it from the 15th position so basically Buchholz saved me uh, from because there were a couple more people with the same score as me, three to one. Yep. And yeah, that day, that day I knew I have to switch my lineup. So I switched to another one that I also did not test. And I just took decks that I um, didn't try this season, but like tried them before, just changed a couple cards for, for the meta calls. And I actually, this might have been a huge reason why, why I won. Because despite like not preparing with these decks, these were actually decks I liked. That's that's a massive thing. I, I just took decks that I felt good playing with. 
very often I take uh, something to the tournament that I that is strong in general, but not in my hands, and it makes me lose them. Yeah. Um, but this time I actually took decks I enjoy playing, and it it also paid off. And there was one more thing uh, mm -hmm. why I think I found success. Let me remind it myself real quick. <laughs> no problem. Um, Hmm. So I already said about the no prep. Uh, oh yes, uh, actually in between all games, uh, I took breaks for like 30 minutes. I, I went outside each time. I didn't really... Um, so I wasn't really waiting for my opponents. Very often that's, that's, what, uh, that's what makes me really, really tired in Swiss early that I wait for the, um, you know, like there's often a situation in Swiss where everyone ended yep. and uh, one pair is still playing and you like don't know if they're going to finish in a second or if the, if it will take 20 more minutes. So this, this is always when I'm like waiting and stressing and getting tired before the game even starts. And this time, since it wasn't Swiss, so I basically had to just wait for my opponent. Each time I went outside, uh, might have been late uh, on time versus some opponents. Like I made one git wait, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes, because I actually went outside to a shop and I met my friends from middle school. So it, it took more time than I, than I thought it will. Uh, but it's, after the, those 15 minutes, I came back um, pretty refreshed and that might be also the reason why I beat one kid, because in China it was like 4 a.m. and he was also probably oh, uh, yep. wait, waiting waiting on me all the time. So that was kind of a... Yeah, so just out of curiosity's sake, how important do you think the, like the draws are, the positions of which opponents you play when is to finding success? That's something I always found fascinating uh, in most tournament play is uh, just when you have to play like Tailbot or Wang ID or whoever else is there, um, how important is your specific opponent that you're playing with your lineup against? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, huh. so I think, I think everyone is beatable. Of course, some people like you, uh, those you mentioned are probably better than your average uh, tournament Gwent player. But I think I think everyone is beatable with the right approach and the the right lineup. Of course, um, some games are almost unwinnable, but I think as long as you're like, as long as you didn't lose three games, you can basically make it happen. And I think I think even it is possible to beat uh, like all the best players in one run if you like have momentum and actually um, play well. I don't know if, if that was the question about, because I don't know if I understood it correctly. Yeah, that's perfect explanation. Um, okay. Yeah. Nice. I was just wondering if, you know, like your path, like, you know, like being where you were playing, who you mm -hmm. did in the quarterfinals and semifinals so matter I'll... a lot, but you saying that all mm -hmm. opponents are beatable. That, yeah, that's, that's very interesting, like, I think. I guess I might like add that my uh, day two road was pretty fortunate because mm -hmm. I basically got the opponent uh, in the first round. I got the same opponent that I did get yesterday. So I already, in a sense, practiced versus him. Mm -hmm. But but he didn't change lineups, and I did. So I kind of had an edge versus him. And in the quarters, I think I've played versus uh, Akala Hucha, who, who is a really great player. So I think it is... Well, it's not the one of the biggest names, like Wang it is, for example. But I still think it was an opponent that could have like won the whole thing. Uh, maybe if he didn't get me in in the in his run. In the semi, I got Villa, and I was pretty sure I am going to get Colmore on Gravesh. Uh, okay. And it was pretty surprising that both uh, they both lost immediately. So then I knew I'm getting Gary Gary or Villa. So I was was getting kind of fired up that it might actually happen if I beat them. Because okay. then I will have two chances. And versus Wangit, I think... Um, I don't know how it would go if I had Wangit immediately. But as I said, like I I had kind of an edge because I made him wait. And 
it was 4 a.m. in China and and some more things. But even versus Wanget, I think I played pretty well and just mm, made the most that I could of with my hands and, and, and matchups. Okay, great. So you this tournament, you, you won a top 64, correct? Not top 16? Yeah, I won top 64. I, I didn't make top 16 that season. Okay, so you won this top 64 on June 21st, and now you don't play the open number three until August 30th. Do you feel that there is like a disadvantage to that or an advantage? Everyone's on the same playing field now, or what are your thoughts about having to wait almost two whole months before you have to play in that open? Um, I think it is fine. I could have, basically I had one month, uh, not one month, the month I qualified, I had like a rest of the season didn't absolutely matter for me. Mm -hmm. So I basically didn't have to hit top 64 because I wouldn't play in the quals next anyways. So I basically just played the absolute minimum, finished placements, uh, made top 500, and that's all. And the second season, I actually uh, had to play because it was already for Open 4. But I had the advantage of not having to play in any quals. So basically, I could play ladder during those uh, two qualifiers in the weekends. But I still didn't... Uh, didn't make a lot out of it and still didn't make top 16 that season. So, okay, but kind of disappointing. Um, uh, yeah, I, I we, we won't move to... on. I was gonna, I was gonna ask a question about qualifying for open number four, but we won't go to that quite yet. Um, so after seeing everybody who qualified for open number three, who are you most looking forward to or as your biggest competition for that? Who are you hoping to like roll into and trying to avoid through that bracket? I don't think there's anyone I would like to avoid. Mm -hmm. I am fine with like getting anyone in the quarter. It it could even be like Tailbot, one game demarcation. If I beat them, I I'll get momentum. If I don't beat them, no one expects me to anyways. <laughs> and I I would like to face Poisoned in the finals. I think that would be a win-win situation. Uh, even if I lost, I wouldn't really be sad if I lost the final to Poisoned. And I also think Actually, as I'm thinking about it, I think Vlastelin is the person I don't want to face the most in the quarters. Okay. I, yeah, it's it's because, I don't know, I expect him to bring something clownish and I might not be ready for it. Okay. So, you want to go against the tailbot demarcation, the, the, the veterans, you can say. Mm -hmm. um, what, I guess... Because you qualified for Open number three, what is your current competitive goal? Is it just to win the Open, or do you plan on keep trying and going until you win the Masters? I know right now uh, no legacy player has gotten out of the quarterfinals for the Opens. Uh, do you plan sure. on being the first one? Like, Do you try to make little goals, or are you just going for you want to win that Masters uh, spot and go there? Mm, yeah, I definitely want to win the Open. Mm -hmm. And... That would be the the easier road to already just win the open. That's three games, three wins, and and I am in. Yep. Uh, but I at the same time, besides the the prep that mm -hmm. I will do this month, I also will obviously try to win top top sixty four this month. Uh, try to play some ladder. I don't think I will be able to hit top sixteen, especially if the scores will be that high as they are right now. Yeah. Um, but I am at least gonna hit the the minimum, so top sixty four, uh, to to have a second chance to get for open four, and hopefully, um, one of those four spots, uh, will go to me, and then I will play on open four as well, and win that one if I don't manage to win the the third one. But if I won, if I win both open three and four, that's even better. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that's about all I have for the open three questions. Let's go back to the beginning. When did you start playing, Gwen? Okay, so there are uh, two moments, I would say, because mm -hmm. the first time I downloaded Gwent was December 2017. Okay. That's what, that's what my GOG account says, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, but... I played only a couple hours then, came back to the game, like June, July, uh, 
2018. So that's more than two years from now. It was basically the end of beta. Yep. There was like three months in beta. I and from from then I basically homecoming started and I played for like the whole homecoming with the idea of just uh, getting better and better. Homecoming was pretty good for me because it was a new start mm -hmm. um, in a sense. Of course, I still didn't have the collection. Uh, I didn't manage to collect that many scraps from beta, but at least uh, everyone had to learn the same game again. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it was a couple months till I made it to pro, a couple months till I learned how to play Gwent properly, mm -hmm. but now I'm... Now you're constantly top 64, so, right? Yeah, I mean, top 64 is much less than I am capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Although ladder is just, um, I never have the the power of will to actually uh, go for the top sixteen. People who are, let's say, um, less efficient but playing more, mm -hmm. or just in general better than me, make the top sixteen. While I'm like always hesitating, do I go for it? Each season, I'm basically in the middle of the season. I'm like uh, uh, around top twenty. Mm, that's that's pretty usual for me to be like 25th after finishing placements but then I actually mm, then I actually face some problems in the middle of the season I don't know the game starts being boring to me or I'm like cannot really move I can't really move from uh, move the peaks so it often it often is that I'm just giving up on making the top 16 and saying I will make it next season. <laughs> and it's been like a couple months right now. I made my first and only top 16 in February. So that's six months. So yeah, it's quite a... Mm -hmm. I know this season, yeah, but... this season you kind of have to balance your time weirdly between mm -hmm. playing ladder and then actually preparing for a tournament. Um, but does actually qualifying for an open, do you think overall is going to help your motivation? when it comes to climbing ladder in the future? Mm, with the idea with the idea that, you know, I've qualified mm -hmm. I've qualified for open before, so I know I can do it again. I just have to really keep grinding. Yeah, true. That that's how it works actually, but it's mm -hmm. it's more with qualifiers. Uh, each qualifiers or each tournament I will go in right mm -hmm. now yep. will be from now on will be just me thinking I can win this thing. Mm -hmm. uh so yeah i've I've done it before i will i might do it again but when it comes to ladder i don't know i i would really need a, a huge break uh a huge breakout i don't know i don't know if i know what the word means anyways what i mean is that i already don't have to really fight for the crown points because i want to make world masters through crown points so yeah. like no point for me to uh, hit high spots uh, older than just um, top 16 qualifiers. Yeah. Um, but from next year, I, I would like to try hard and um, maybe make the World Masters from, from crown points if I don't manage to win an Open or whatever the, the system will be because it might change, I don't know. Uh, but for for this year, I don't really have to fight for the top spots. I might hit... Uh, actually, wait. This season and next season left. Mm -hmm. And that's that would be all. So I'm not going to make top 16 this season anymore, okay. basically. Yeah. Okay. We're almost out of time, so there's one last question. At what mm -hmm. point... So at what point did you want to play competitive, um, competitive Gwent? And what steps did you take to help you be more competitive and get to the your first open okay so i wanted i actually despite not having a card game background or not being a anywhere near close being a pro level in any other game ever yep i when when i started playing Gwent, i really really early thought that this might be the game for me like you didn't have to have any manual skills. You're only thinking. Uh, you also don't have to have a great PC. Uh, it, it, it's a pretty simple game. And yeah, it turns out that 
I've been wasting myself playing, I don't know, like FPS or, or whatever other games that required more skill. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if, that, if I can say it like this, but I mean, <laughs> card games card games aren't less skillful in a sense, but at the same time, they require you to do less. And I, I really, really, um, over time, I started really, really loving Gwent. I still don't like card games, but Gwent is an exception. And yeah, I I would say even before Homecoming started, I already thought, well, I, I would like to be a pro in this game after watching um the the challenger four and the open seven and from now from from when homecoming started i just played um, maybe not a lot because that wasn't really a lot compared to what some people do play uh, in a month uh, on pro rank but i still played a lot uh, as for myself to actually move forward. Uh, I also played some tournaments because, mm -hmm. uh, well, if you're just good at ladder and bad at tournaments, then you're not really going to do much in Gwent, do you? So uh, I, I decided to to like play every possible tournament when I could have. I also just kept improving uh, every month. And right now I'm at a level when where I don't really have to play the game to make top 64. And yeah, I, I guess I, I am going to move forward, but I don't really know uh, how forward can I move for now on. Because as I said, like the top 16 isn't really in my side, but I guess I can I can just try to become a better tournament player, starting from winning the, the Open uh, by the end of the month. Okay. Well, I wish you the best of luck in Open number three. I hope you win. And if you do, and even if you don't, hopefully we can do another talk, you know, about your preparation for that and kind of what went down there. Um, thank you for making time to talk with me. Yeah, thank you also for inviting me to the to the show. Uh, I had a lot of fun uh, answering the questions. And yeah, thank you guys. For, thank you guys for listening. Mm, yeah, I don't know if I want to say anything else. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Danarai. Thank you uh, also. I want to thank Danarai again for taking time out of his busy schedule to talk with me. Uh, thank you all for watching. This has been the official Legacy Podcast.